I'll be happy to help. Just imagine how pleased Farm will be when she sees it. I finished it at last, and not a moment too soon, if you ask me. Joe, where have you been? Need you ask? Just like what she's wearing. Say what you'd like about my writing hat, but I've just written the closing scene for the witch's curse that was a divine inspiration. Well, we finished turning the tree without you. This won't be the same without the presents. It's dreadful to be poor. I can remember when we used to be rich. I remember too. It's not fair that some girls have plenty of lovely things, while other girls, prettier girls, have nothing at all. We're better off than so many others, though. Orphans, for instance. We still have father and money and each other. But we don't have father, and probably won't for quite some time. Who can say how long the war will last? Many families in the North and South will be missing their men this year. The army's having a dreadful winter. Supplies are scarce. Marmy's right when she says we shouldn't buy each other presents. We have to make some sacrifices, too. I don't mind most of the sacrifices, but I am tired of having to remake these dresses year after year. None of you suffer the way I do. You don't have to go, through, go to school with impertinent girls who label your father just because he's poor. If you mean Milo, say so. And stop talking about Papa as if he was a pickle jar. I know what I mean. And you need to be statical about it. It's proper to use good words and improve your vocabulary. Woo! Vocabulary? Christopher Columbus, aren't we proper? Don't, Joe. It's so boyish. I That's why I do it. I hate rude, unladylike girls. And I hate affected little chits. We're in a little mess. It's a great... Really now, you're both to blame. Amy, your prim ways are funny now, but you'll grow up to be an affected little goose if you aren't careful. And as for you, Joe, it's time you stopped your boyish tricks. You should turn up your hair now and remember that you are a young lady. I ain't. And if turning up my hair makes me one, I'll wear two tails till I'm 20. I don't want to grow up and be Miss March. I won't be prim as a porcelain doll. I just can't get over my disappointment in not being a boy. Look at me. I'm dying to go out and find home with Papa, and all I can do is sit at home and knit, like some pokey old woman. Where, Jim? Oh, I don't want your pity. Because one day, I'll be a famous writer, and I'll make a fortune writing books. Then, I'll live and be him as I please. And Amy, you'll have dozens of dresses with satin lace, and Meg will have plenty of handsome bows to dance with, and a beautiful new piano for my nephew. I should like that. So no more arguing, and let's get to work on our play. Beth, play something something gruesome for us. Amy, I wrote a new scene for you. It's wonderful. Oh no! It's very simple. All you have to do is shout, Rodrigo, Rodrigo, save me, save me! Then faint. Oh, Mr. Lawrence is great. 
grandson. It's kind of a live with him. I didn't know the old house quite had a grandson. Oh, and from what I've heard, he sounds like a funny one. Why? What's he done? Oh, well, besides running away from school. That's the bravest thing I've ever heard. He was found in our registration office. He lied about his age and tried to join up. Can you imagine? I certainly can. I should like to do the same thing. Find someone you'd make. Joe, don't. Oh, Joe. It's our private property. I can look at as much as I like. You're as bad as he is. There he is. Amy, Beth, stand back through the window. Well, I'm certainly glad he's a boy. I should like to get to know a boy and have some fun for a change. Don't say such things. I wonder how I can get to know him. I know. Our cat can get lost, and then he can bring it back. That doesn't sound very romantic. Who said anything about romance? You over here! Hello! <laughs> Joe, you're disgracing us! Hello! <laughs> that wretched boy. He went back. Perhaps now you can draw the curtains and we can finish rehearsing our play. I suppose. Where are we? Rodrigo! Rodrigo! Save me! Save me! Oh, well, perhaps if you tried it like... Or maybe... Oh, it's no use. Do the best you can when the time comes, and if the audience boos, don't blame me. I'm glad to find you so merry, my friend. Marty! Oh, oh, oh. You're so tired. Has anyone called Seth? Not today, Marmy. Shakes hands, but so. Oh. 
Auntie, there's no point in dwelling on the past, really. And Besides, it was our money that got lost, and it hasn't got anything to do with you. Don't be impertinent with me, Missy. It's a waste of time talking to you, Miss Josephine March. You're as pig-headed as your father. You have much common sense with a dizzy cow. It's a waste of time talking to all of you, really. It's like talking to a flock of geese. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Aunt March. Aunt March, wait. How do you plan to try my patience now, Miss Impertinence? It's just that I would like to apologize for my outburst, and I'd be willing to bear the hatchet if you want. So, what you say? Amy, what are you doing? I want to hear what she's saying to Aunt March. Amy! So, if the position is still open, I would like to be your personal companion. You certainly are a trial, Miss Josephine March, but I suppose the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. So, you can come around after the holidays if it suits you. Thank you, Aunt March. You won't be sorry. Merry Christmas, Josephine. Well, it's all settled then. What is? I'm Aunt March's new personal companion. Oh? I read her books, keep her company, and make a pleasant conversation. Pleasant conversation? When do you begin, dear? After the holidays. May we open our envelopes now, Marmee? Oh, yes, Amy. A dollar? Oh, my! Oh, my. oh how funny. I can buy a new book. Maybe The Black Adventure. Oh, I'd love a new bonnet with ribbons and lace and a long feather. I'll get a set of favorite drawing pencils and a new sketch pad. <laughs> and what will you buy, Becky? I should like some new sheet music. Maybe run to the shops now, Marnie, before they close. All right, girls. What about Father's? Yes, our letter. First, our letter from Father. Come in. To my loving wife. Give my girls a kiss and tell them I think of them by day and pray for them by night and find my best comfort in their affections at all times. I know that they remember all that I've said and be loving children to you and work diligently, but these hard times need not be wasted. I know they will fight their bosom enemies bravely and conquer themselves so beautifully that when I come back to them, I may be father and father together. And father and father. Yes, sir? Sorry to disturb you, ma'am, but it's a message from Mrs. Hummel. Wants to know if you can come right away. Oh, of course, Anna. Amy, can you hear Grandma with the telegraph So Christmas was a time of presents once more. Presents for our Marmy. We could hardly contain our excitement over the surprise we knew would await our Marmy in the morning. But our holiday fervor was momentarily surpassed by the preparations for our special performance. The Christmas Eve premiere of The Witch's Curse, an operatic tragedy. You do know, of course, that the March family was once one of the most prominent families in Concord. 
Genteel gatherings of the right people and dances hosted by the March family were quite commonplace in those days. What happened to bring them down so far, Miss Grimeck? Well, my dear, it was foolish Mr. March in its altruistic ways, attempting that ridiculous integrated school in his communal farm. Ha! <laughs> Why, it's absolutely scandalous. And I shan't say another word for fear of corrupting you young, impressionable girls with his wretched progressive ideas. I will say, everyone in town pays for Mrs. March for her foolish. Excuse me, Mother, but who's the employees come to say I'm old Mr. Lawrence is home? Hortense told me he's from Europe. Sally, 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 my dear child. It is never polite to gossip about others until you know all the facts. Now old Mr. Lawrence's grandson is quite another story altogether. He'd make a fine catch for one of you young ladies in a few years. Why, he'll be the most eligible man in Concord when he comes of age. Quite a lot of money there, you know. But of course, I would never discuss that with you girls. It would be terribly indiscreet to discuss finances. <coughs> tragedy.
hundred festivities with your friends. Thanks to Marmy and the wonderful holiday delicacies provided by Mr. Lawrence, my play felt as though it had been every bit the success I had hoped it would be. Our spirits were buoyed even further by the anticipation of Christmas morning and the wonderful surprise our presents would be for our Marmy. Christopher Columbus! after another. Six children, half frozen in the tub, left in one bed and no fire. All skin and bones they are. So your mother took her breakfast over there. And while I believe in charity as much as the next person, we haven't got anything to spare. Didn't she see her presents? Oh yes, and right pleased with them she was. Now your mother said you'd have your breakfast and be straight on to church. She'll meet you there. starving everywhere, every day. If you let that worry you, you'll never eat at all. I try not to think about it. We don't know those people, but we do know the Hummels. We passed their house on the way to church. Joe, you're not saying you're going to bring our breakfast to the Hummels, are you? You wouldn't do a thing like that, would you? I could. So could I. Well, it's all in on. Well, I don't suppose none of us is an option. Oh, all right, but I insist on a secret vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Oh, fine. Aye. <laughs> well, it's decided then. Let's find the lock. Put those down. Now let's go on, Anna. We're up to church, Anna. Just one stop along the way. Is my whole breakfast off of the Hummels then? The whole breakfast, Hannah. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose it's fair for wood, too. Oh, you're an angel, Hannah. <laughs> Merry Christmas. 
you. You heard all that, you know. And you ran away from school and tried to join up? I think it's just plumbing. We really should be going. I've seen you watching us from your window, and I... Uh, I, I didn't mean to be rude, but it's so dull at Grandfather's. Dull's a tomb, to be frank. And everything in your house is so lively. Like a picture of the lamps you lit, and you've gotten around your mother. Where's your mother? She died very shortly after my father. Oh, I'm so sorry. I give you leave to watch us anytime you like, and it's come over and turn the picture if you feel like it. I couldn't. Grandfather would say I was imposing. Oh, Bilgewater! Theodore Lawrence, you are officially invited to call the march home whenever you please. Thank you. I will. Josephine, please. Honestly, Meg. Let's go. Well, goodbye. For now. For now. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Miss March. Josephine March, what will they think of us now, stopping and talking in the street like that without being properly introduced? Oh, I don't care. And I'll bet they don't care either. Besides, you weren't very polite. You're getting as prissy as Amy. It wouldn't hurt you to say hello. Right after the way that man stared at me. What man? Oh, you mean Mr. Brooke? I hadn't noticed. Well, I had. Oh, my. What? What is it? He's still looking. Who is? Mr. Brooke. Don't look. Who, me? <laughs> And so ended the first brief encounter with one who had become one of the truest friends our little family would ever know. But as winter began to melt away into spring, I wondered if my invitation to call on us would ever be taken up by young Mr. Lawrence. Too smart to wonder about who wanders about her. 
Perhaps I'd better go. Oh no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be out of sorts. Oh, sorry. Don't worry about it. Do you really want to go? No, not really. Everything at Grandpa's is just so dull and everything over here is so lively. I'm glad you like it here. You know, I was wondering if I could be one of your plays sometime. Would that be alright? I'll say. I would love for someone else to play the villain for a change. Oh, and I know my fence too. Really? Really? Here. <laughs> I'm there. I'm there. Okay, okay, what say you? A touch, I do confess. Why well, don't you quit your walking? There's somebody at the door. I can go ask Grandfather to fetch the carriage and take you to the train station. You'll need money for the train expenses, but we don't have enough in our savings to pay for those things. I'll go and ask how much. Quick, the girls will have to mother pack. few hours were spent preparing Margie for her journey. I set out for Aunt March's house on my self-appointed mission. I thought our request to help Barbie get to father would be an unpleasant but simple task. I never imagined how my journey would end. And now I think that should be everything. Don't forget these. I wonder what to be keeping Joe. The carriage is meeting outside, and your grandfather saw long about the court this March. Oh, thank you. Can I have your voice to your grandfather's? Is that the same as in my traveling classroom? Yes, ma'am. Grandma, let's see. Where's Joe? Well, where is she? Where is she? Where is that proud-tempered daughter of yours? I, I thought she was with you on March. Not very likely. Not after her visit. <coughs> You ask for. Oh, thank you very much, Oh, pitch posh and model. You're too sentimental, you are? Well, you know how to get there? You change the train to New York, a horrid, horrid city, and then you I don't believe that'll be necessary. For Miss Florence to ask me to accompany Miss March on the train as she takes me to Washington safely. Oh, thank you, Mr. Lucas. No, no, it'd be my pleasure to be of service to you and your family. Besides, Miss Lord Lawrence has already asked me to complete some tasks while I'm down there, so you see. But you're all terribly kind. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Okay, with your permission, I'll load your luggage into the carriage for you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Lucas. I want to apologize for being less than a compassionate student. You've been terribly kind to me. You don't know how much a relief it is to know that Barney has someone to look after her. Thank you, Miss Lucas. Goodbye. Goodbye. for someone to remember me too for a change, but I hope it all goes for the best. But I doubt it. Not much. Yes, Miss Josephine, here I am, and no thanks to you. I had to get up, get dressed, and ride over here by myself, because you're so, so stubborn. Well, you certainly don't get that from my side of the family. Good day. Joe, oh, where have you been all this time? Marvin was worried sick. We all were. Yes, we would have kept you this long. I went to Aunt March, and she croaked like she always does when someone asks her to open her purse, and well, I lost my temper. There he is, her own nephew, sick in the hospital, and all she can do is complain about money. So, well, here's my contribution. Thank you, Joe. What is that dollar? Where on earth did you get it, Joe? I came by it, honestly. I only sold it belonged to me. Oh, Joe, it's just a beauty. It doesn't affect the state of the union. I just happened by the wig maker shop and saw some tails appear in the window with the price tags on them and figured it might do me some good to have my mouth cut out too. So I did. Thank you, Joe. 
I'm in a hurry now, Miss Marsh. Christopher Columbus, what happened to you? You look like a porcupine. I'm sorry. Arthur's convalescence in that Washington hospital lasted many months, and life in our little home soon found a simple domestic pattern in Marmy's absence. Our friendship with Lori continued to grow, and the surprising support and neighborly friendship of his grandfather was a boon to all our spirits. I had worked furiously at my scribbling stern that summer, and had begun sending off some of my manuscripts to publishers. Then, an important letter arrived for me that fall. Now I'll see what you've been up to with all your scribbling lately. Is this why you haven't had time for me? Return it now, Mr. Lawrence, or never speak to me again. Ugh, oh, fine. Just like a girl. Because you said we have to have these secrets, and then this. Well, this is different. It's still a secret. No. Well, you can keep it, because I've got one of my own, and it's plumb. Very? Very. All right, if that's the game you're going to play, you tell me yours, and I tell you mine. Fine. Read it yourself. Pay to the order of Miss Josephine March, one dollar in clothes for the story entitled The Penny Man. What do you think of that? One dollar. Go on, laugh, but that's just the start. Someday I'll make as high as ten. Oh, I swear I'll never understand you. Cooped up in my attic, writing away every spare minute, missing out on all the fun times you can be having out here. And for what? A measly dollar? Joe, if it's money you want, I've got plenty of it. It's not the money. Not really. It's a feeling I get. A strange, nervous feeling on the inside. It's my work, and soon it will be in print. People will read it, something that I wrote. I don't understand it, but it makes you happy, I suppose. Well now, play fair, Teddy. What's your secret? <coughs> I don't know where some blood is. Is that all? Ask me where it is. Well, where is it? The book has it. How do you know? I saw it. Where? We picked it up off the ground when they danced together at Grandfather's party. Isn't that romantic? No! Oh, I thought you'd be pleased. Pleased? At the thought of someone taking Meg away? Why do things always have to change, just when they seem perfect? Meg used to share everything with me. And now she keeps to herself and thinks that John is a lovely name and brown eyes are beautiful. Well, I think it's sickly sentimental, romantic rubbish, and he better not try and break our family up. You'll feel differently when someone comes to take you away. I should like to see someone try. I'll be a spinster, rowing my own canoe before I let any man catch me. I'll catch you, Josephine Marsh. Never! Open the door, open up! Hey! Good afternoon, Miss Josephine. Good afternoon, Mr. Theodore. <coughs> Thank you for your assistance this afternoon, John. My pleasure. Well, goodbye, Mr. Brooke. Yes, well, goodbye, John. Goodbye, Meg. I have never been so embarrassed in all my days. When are you going to stop behaving like a child? Not until I'm old and stiff and need a crutch. Don't try and make me grow up before my time, Meg. It's hard enough having you change all of a sudden. Let me be a little girl as long as 
I can. Why, I haven't changed at all. But it's time you stopped your romping ways. Just look at you. No hairpins, no combs. Run down the street like a loose horse. I wish I were a horse. Oh, you're such a child. Perhaps I'd better go. Wait, Joe, this one. Why are you mad at me? Hannah? Hannah? Where's Hannah? What's the matter, Beth? No, Joe, don't come near me. I feel so strange. I... Please just get Hannah. Hannah! Hannah! Here, Bethy, why don't you come sit down on the couch? What's the matter, Joe? Don't come near me. What is it? Scarlet fever is no joke. But it's Stella, Aunt Marches, and she's cross. And I don't want to be set off until I'm in the way. It's to keep you safe. You know, I'll tell you what. I'll pop in every day and tell you how Beth is doing. Will you take me out driving? Every single day on my own. And bring me back the minute Beth is well? The identical minute. See if I don't. Well, all right then. There's a good girl. The days dragged out slowly into weeks. Meg and Hannah and I kept a constant vigil near Beth's bedside. We sensed the slightest change in her person. Amy's notes arrived daily, but nothing could relieve our anxiety and sorrow as we began to sense just how fragile Beth's hold in life had become. Hannah. Oh, don't come. I just came by to say she was coming so the fever's broken by now. I'm afraid we'll have to send for Mrs. March as soon as May returns. Oh, Hannah. You children begged me to telegram you weeks ago, but I was afraid of Freddie to understand. But now the doctor says that the end may be very soon, and Miss Beth is the current moment. Hannah? Yes, Miss. She doesn't even recognize us. I wish Marty were here. It's all right, Joe. I'm here. I'll be strong for you. Mom, that sent that telegram. Joe, Marty will be here soon. No, she won't. How could she be? There isn't time. Well, Grandma probably got the gene, and so did I. So we decided to send Brooke down to fetch her. She'll be here on the 5 o'clock train. Marty? Here? In a few hours? Yes, Joe. Oh, Marty. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to fly you like that, but I didn't know any other way to say thank you. Fly me again around the lake. No, thank you. I'll do it by proxy when your grandfather arrives. Oh, Lord. If life's as hard as this, I don't think I'll ever get through it. Well, I'll laugh and I'll tell you, just like old times. You'll see. I hope so. I truly do. Now, I'm off to the station and I shan't spend the horses. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> thank you.
great since the fever's broken. She's swift to pull you now. Oh, thank heavens. We're going to have plenty of warm left to her. We're sharing the best sleep we can, and we'll help her fall under the recovery and slap it a bang this. Oh, Hannah, you truly are an angel. What about Amy? Said for as soon as the doctor said.
big prince of Brella, you see? And wait, wait, wait. Brella? That boy's tutor? I see it now. He's proposed, hasn't he? Please, he might hear you. Shall I go get father? Have you accepted him? Do you intend to marry this pup? Please. Not until I speak my mind. Now let me tell you, miss, that if you marry this pup of corn, rope of corn, crook, not a penny of my money goes to you. I shall marry whom I please on March, and you can leave your money to anyone you please. Now be a reasonable girl. It is your duty to marry a rich man and help your family, and you can be sure that this fellow knows you have a rich relation. Me. And that's why he wants to marry you. Why, my John would no more marry for money than I would. Tidy, tidy, aren't we, Miss Independence? <laughs> well, fine. You'll be sorry for it once you try to love in a cottage and find it a failure. It can't be worse than what one finds in a big, empty house. <laughs> well, I never. Well, you do as you please. You are my good advice, Gitsby. But remember, the day you marry him is the day I disinherit you. Now I, I, well, you made me forget why I came to form us insolence. I washed my hands. The law, yeah. Mr. I could help it over here, man. And thank you. <coughs> Thanks all much for showing you that you care for me just a little bit. I didn't know how much until she said all those dreadful things. Will you wait for me? Marvin, Marvin, come downstairs quick! John Burke is acting dreadfully! And Meg likes it! <laughs> <laughs> Megan John's spring engagement brought about a hailstorm of criticism for more people than Aunt March and I, as we were soon to learn. Run as fast as you can, and I'll catch every one of you. Shocking. Simply shocking. Why, it's a complete disgrace if you ask me. What is it, Mother? The way she lets her girls run about hither, thither, and yon, like a pack of wild animals. And playing with a boy, no less, as if that were appropriate behavior for a young lady in a public place. I should like to get well completed. It might be a bit more fun than sitting around and doing needlework. Or traipsing around town making social calls on people I don't even like. Stop right where you are, young ladies. Your mother would never tolerate such impotence, and neither shall I. Those simply are not proper thoughts for a young lady to think, let alone speak out loud. But, Mother, we appear to be quite alone here. Don't talk back to me, Sally Gardner. Shame, really. I wonder where that Lord's boy is. No. That's interesting. Where are you? Oh, Miss Gardner. Please forgive me, ladies. I'm so terribly sorry. It's so. See, I'm in a bit of a excuse me. I will never allow you or your friends to make a spectacle of yourselves the way Mrs. March does with her motley crew. She clearly doesn't know the proper way to secure a good marriage, and she's willing to go to any means to achieve her plan. Whatever do you mean, Miss Gardner? Well, it's also obvious, my dear child. The three of you are so innocent to the ways of the world. Surely you can see Mrs. March is an ambitious woman, ambitious for her daughters. Meg's engagement to Mr. Brooke is just the beginning of a low ploy to ingratiate her family to old Mr. Lawrence. But she has plans for her daughters, all right. Her mother says Meg has a much better match than Mr. Brooke. Not at all, my dear, not at all. He is just their first step into the Lawrence household. Just as Marsh views this Lawrence boy as the icing on the cake, he'll make a grand catch for her family. She's simply throwing her three remaining guards to him the same way one throws scent in front of a hound. I don't think our mother would appreciate you referring to Mr. Lawrence as, well, some sort of domestic pet. Come, Bill, you must be getting home now. Well, she may not be sharing her opinions with you on the matter, but you can trust me when I say that everyone in town is talking about it, and they said just as much as I have. If not more, and in less, uh, fastidious terms. Oh, mother.
Joe, are you all right? It wasn't bothering Joe. It don't bother me. Good. I'm not upset. I'm angry. Good and angry. Why, I can spit tacks. Mommy doesn't have plans for us. Does she? I've got you. <laughs> Well, I said I would catch all of you, but I didn't think it would be this easy. Wait, what's the matter, Joe? What's wrong? Why are you hiding? Maybe we aren't the ones who've been caught. And sooner still was John and Meg's wedding day. Our lives were so full of preparations and plans for the wedding that we scarcely had time to think about the void that would be left in our little house on the day of Meg's departure. But that day came at last, and with it those same feelings of joy and loss that attend the members of those weddings. The celebration's just begun. Don't cry, Joe. Don't cry. It'll be all right. No, it won't. Our family will never be the same again. You still have me, Joe. I know. No matter how much I appreciated that, I did before. Now that I have my silly scene, and we should return to the party before the next. Wait, there's something we need to ask you. No, Teddy, please don't. Yes, I will. And this time you must listen. The sooner the better for both of us. Is that what you like, Ben? I love you, sir. Joe, I've loved you ever since I met you. I tried to show you both. You wouldn't let me. Now I'm going to make you hear and give me an answer. I wanted to save you this. I never wanted you to feel for me this way. I've tried to keep you from it when I could. And I only loved you all the more for it. I've tried to show you the world ever since I came back from college. I know. I know I'm not happy good luck, but if you love me, you can make me into anything you like. I wouldn't change you, Lord. Not for the world. It's you who need to change me. You should marry someone lovely and accomplished who adore you and grace your fine house. I couldn't. I loathe the social world and you like it. You hate my scribbling and I can be found without it. In the end, we quarrel and... No, no. Yes! We always have! It would be horrid if we were ever foolish enough to... Marry? No, it wouldn't. It could be heaven if we take a chance. Please don't disappoint me. Grandfather has his heart set on it. And your family too, Joe. Please don't disappoint me. Say you will. Marry me. I can't. Oh, Lori, I'm sorry. I've tried to love you the way you want. I'm so proud and fond of you, and I do love you. I love you so dearly as a friend, but I could never love you as a wife. It would be a lie to say I do, but I don't. Really and truly, Joe? Really and truly. I don't believe I shall ever marry. I love my liberty too well to give it up for any man. Yes, you will. I know you. You'll meet some no-account, good-for-nothing idiot and fall in love. It's your way. You'll work and work and live and die from what? Stand by and see it all. Well, I'll be hanged if I do. Wait, Lord, wait, Lord. To the devil! Someday I'll be sorry, Joe March. to marry rich people or something. You asked me the other day what my wishes were, and I'll tell you as soon as I've heard what you want. Well, I suppose I wish you a good many things for you girls. I want you to be admired and loved and respected, lead good and useful lives, and pray life's and as little sorrow as possible. Of course, I'm ambitious for you, like any other mother. I'd be happy to see you marry a rich man, if you love him, but I'd rather see you be a poor man's wife or a spinster than that you lose your self-respect Happiness and love was married, even if it made you feel the way. You think you wanted to do like this? I knew I was right. I'm never getting married. Why, Joe? No, I've thought about it a lot, and I'm restless. I need to be out seeing and doing. I just, I want to hop a little ways and try my wings. Well, where do you intend to hop? New York. Why, Joe, I... I'm, Amy can take care of Aunt March now. They're more compatible anyhow, and you have Beth to help you here. Well, I thought I could work at Mrs. Kirk's. 
She's been looking for someone to help with the children, and with so much to see in here, I would get lots of new ideas for my stories. Oh, Joey, be sure that you're writing to me something, or I'll wait for you. Or someone. Is it Lori? Oh, Marlene. He's gotten this romantic rubbish into his head, and I thought it would all blow over by now, but it's only gotten worse. Well, how do you feel about it? I love him so much as a friend. So I think if I go away for a while, things can get back to normal. I just know I don't want to make a mistake. Oh, Joe, you're right. Well, right to his heart, your father agrees that he managed. You shall go. Oh, Joe, thank you. Come on, come on dear. I have to go and see Nick and John off on their honeymoon. All right, Army. Working at Mrs. Kirk's boarding house was one of the most exhausting and exhilarating experiences that I have known. New York flooded my mind with new sights and new friends, the most important of whom, Professor Fritz Baer. I shared so many thoughts and ideals similar to my own that I felt I had found a true kindred spirit. However, in the midst of my newfound fortunes, fate was going to spring a rude surprise, which was the consequence of my abominable tongue. Tea, then. Oh, good gracious, no. I've completed my business here, driven town, and finished my afternoon call in the brief, even capably for my papa. Very good, ma'am. Well, now to the point. As you all know, I'm going abroad to Europe next month, and I'll be needing a proper traveling companion. We'll wire for Joe immediately, Auntie. Joe? Oh, good gracious, no. I said a proper traveling companion. <clears throat> that one has such a blood disposition, she put a freezing foreign relations for the next decade. Goodness, no. Oh, but no arguments, please, and quite decide about this. Amy will accompany me. A more similar in temperament, Amy is docile and respectful, and she will receive this opportunity graciously without a sense of entitlement, unlike the other one. Auntie, I don't think. Oh, hush, my child. Anything you say will be stuff and nonsense. Besides, Rome will be just the place for you to study your art. Okay, don't worry. Thank you, Auntie. This will be an exceptional opportunity. Posh, really. Thank you, Moshi. Nonsense, nonsense. Well, I'm off to town now to begin our preparations. Good afternoon. You can call me tomorrow so we begin arrangements for your traveling wardrobe. Good afternoon, Moshi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <coughs> Goodbye, Aunt Martin. Thank you again. Europe with you, a world of good, child, a world of good. Oh, Marmy. Poor Joe. Aunt March is quite decided. It would be wrong for us to try and change your wishes now. I'm afraid there will be no one doing things for Joe this time. But she'll be so dreadfully disappointed. How will I ever explain this to her? Well, let's not spoil your good fortune now with those concerns. Joe will have a reward someday, and it'll be every bit as unexpected and wonderful as yours. Uh, father's right. No reproach and no regrets. We can stop in New York before you say I'll see her personally, if that'll help. Yes, Marmy, that would be a comfort. I hate to be selfish, but I'm glad that Joe's and Chad went quite so, late, so far away from my sister. It's hard enough to bear a rock in New York. Yes, dear, I know. Well, enough conversation for now. We have some preparations to begin.
Amy's visit was a comfort for us both. Her gentle ways and thoughtful words did much to ease the pain of losing my long anticipated European tour. Aunt March informed me that Lori and Mr. Lawrence had also booked passage to the continent. However, during those long days before they set sail, no calling card from my dear Teddy ever arrived. Lori's intended slight wound gave me every bit as deeply as he had hoped, but no experience in my life had prepared me for the telegram I received several months later. So it was with a strange mix of emotions that I returned home to Concord after receiving that urgent message. She was, but your parents wouldn't allow it. It's a long, costly trip, and it wouldn't be fair to all March. So that Betty never worried about anyone but herself. Poor dear. She must be heart sick. Yeah, she is, but Mr. Lawrence sent for us at the end of I bet they would try to keep mine. I'm sure they will, and Lori's such a comfort. Joe? Oh, Joe, you were right last night. Hannah? I must have been so empty without you. Uh, put the kettle on, Hannah. I'll go fetch Carmen down the train. I'm sorry. There must be something we can do. Nothing. It's just a matter of time, Marjorie. The most important thing is for us to stay strong for Chrissy. You mustn't let her see us cry. I know you will. I can never doubt you for a moment, my brave girl. Oh, John, it's so nice to have you home again. Oh, good. Nice to have you. I missed you. I've been hoping to see you, Jill. And here you are. Just like I dreamed. Then you were here for help together. Oh, Dad. Sorry to interrupt, but. Yes. Yes, John, you're right. We should be getting back to the twins now. <coughs> oh, bring them around in the morning if you'd like. Yes. I'm so eager to see them. Yes, Mom. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Amanda, I have so much to tell you. We'll leave them to you're catching up then. Yes, good night, Betty. I'll see you now. Good night, Joe. Good night. Well then, Betty's first. Go on, wind it up. Oh, Joe. Each 
Henceforth, safe across the river, I shall see forevermore a beloved household spirit waiting for me on the shore. Hope and faith born of my sorrow, guardian angels shall be come, and the sister ground of by their hands shall be made. With Beth's passing came the fulfillment of my promise to her, and each passing day filled our thoughts with the brief but special memories of our time with her. Often I awoke at night thinking Beth had called me. But when the sight of her empty bed brought me to tears, Army's arms were always there to gather me up, soothe me with their touch and silent eloquence. Yet each day slowly lost some of its bitter pain as her memory was rendered more serene. And with the turning of the seasons, time brought new life and unexpected change into the March household once more. So, Ted and I are off to the wedding party. Father and John are driving over straight from the station. I know Amy was so eager to see you. She and Lori missed us so much at the wedding in Nice. Won't you reconsider? I'll be fine, Harvey. Besides, if someone has to keep the home fire burning until the entourage arrives, and I'll be seeing Aunt March soon enough, I suppose. I just worry some. We've all had to bear so much lately, but I find my mind coming back to you for more. You are right, John. I know how disappointed you were when Aunt March and Amy Yes. Is it the marriage joke? Oh no, Lori. <coughs> Things worked out just the way they should have. I've just been feeling a bit lonely lately. Lonely for the things that can never be the way they were again. Perhaps if Lori had proposed to me now, I might have said yes. Just because it would be more lonely to be loved than it used to. Oh, John. Your time will come. No. I don't think I'll ever marry. Well, you've always known what you've wanted, Joe. You've got rich people and great people. You'll be right, but that's nothing because it's not all along what you've wanted. Thank you, Mom. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank you.
Now that things are settled properly, we can go back to doing things the way we did in the old times. Oh, no. Things can never be the same. We're men and women now, but we can be brother and sister and love and help each other for the rest of our lives. Yes, Joe. Always. <laughs> Where is she? Where is my old Joe? Oh, baby, just look at you. My Joe. I'm so proud of congratulations. My Becky. By Josephine March. Well, read for us, Joe. Oh, really, I couldn't. Oh, oh please, please. Oh, All right. <laughs> Dedicated with love to my sister Becky. My mind drifts back to that Christmas Eve so long ago, when nothing in our little home seemed wrong, and nothing in the world outside seemed 